the German media on Nord Stream, for example. Here, a major piece of infrastructure was blown up, I believe most likely by the United States or the UK, but on the Western side, quiet, silence. When I said this on American television, I was immediately cut off. But then, by the way, all of the circumstantial evidence points in that way. Sweden, <laughs> incredibly, uh, says, okay, we've investigated, but we're not going to share the results of our investigation with Germany. Members of the Bundestag ask, we want to know the facts. The German government says, no, uh, you cannot know the facts. Uh, this is a security issue. We're supposed to take this? We, we call ourselves democracies? And this is the level of discourse? So the media really, I, and I mean, look, there's a lot of media and you're part of it and it's great. We're having a, a, a wonderful open discussion and points of view that are very hard to express actually in the mainstream. But this mainstream media has lost its way. I can't tell you how disappointed I am every day in the New York Times. What I've I done is simply explain the obvious. It just was a story that was uh, begging to be told. In late September uh, last of uh, 2022, eight bombs were supposed to go off. Six went off uh, under the water in um, uh, near Bornholm Island in um, in the Baltic Sea, in an area where it rather rather shallow area. And they destroyed uh, three three of the four major pipelines, the North Stream one and two, uh, feeding fuel, gas forever, uh, for many years at great low discounts. And so the the meeting was convened to do to study the problem. What are we going to do? Uh, Russia is going to go to war. How can we? This is the three months before the war. When it was the CIA and the National Security Agency, the State Department and the Treasury Department, the Joint Chiefs of Staff had a representation. And this is a secret group. They were meeting in the most secret. Uh, they were meeting in a very secret offices. And this is I'm writing this obviously from inside. Is uh, do you want do you want us to give you recommendations about what to do about stopping Russia that are reversible? more sanctions, economic pressure, we'd already been doing that, or irreversible, irreversible being kinetic, bomb, bomb, bang, bang. Well, it was clear very early. Uh, I don't quite know uh, how how my old newspaper, the New York Times, how much longer they can pretend the story doesn't exist because it's just irrational to do so. For the last 20 years, the U.S. has walked away from arms control regimes and has broken the arms control regime entirely um, with the, uh, you know, the unilateral withdrawal in 2019 by Donald Trump from the Intermediate Nuclear Missile Treaty, INF. Um, there was a real sense that, look, the U.S. is going to place intermediate nuclear missiles in Ukraine just, you know, few minutes launch time to landing to Moscow. Uh, the Chinese are afraid that if the U.S. does this in the in Taiwan, the Chinese are fear that in in South Korea, President Yoon, who's a kind of Trump-like figure, has said we can put missiles in South Korea, in Taiwan, and so on. Um, the Chinese also fear that because the U.S. has walked out of the INF treaty. So in that sense, this has really destabilized the world. And I'm interested that in a country like Germany. The debate is so much around Ukraine and Russia that these broader uh, points, these broader issues are not really part of the general uh, political discussion, you know, which would, I think, enable people to have a much wider and deeper understanding of the issues uh, that are taking place in and around Ukraine. Here's our record as a nation when it comes to a rules based international order or authoritarian government or large countries invading small countries, all of that kind of talk that what you just said refers to. The United States invaded Korea, it's a small country. The United States invaded Vietnam, it's a small country. The United States invaded Afghanistan, it's a, one of the poorest countries on the face of the earth and a small country. The United States invaded Iraq, in every, I could go on, in Libya and so forth. We have a history as a nation 
if there are rules-based international order, then the rule that we can identify is the United States does what it wants to do in the last 75 years, and either the United Nations goes along or it doesn't, but it doesn't really matter. And, and people like me who are close to the American government in terms of my personal life and my personal friendships, it doesn't enter into their mind. Therefore, suddenly, to be outraged when another country, in big country, relatively, invades a small one, relatively, uh, to be all excited about taking moral positions, uh, wow, that requires a level of blindness and gullibility and one-sidedness that's a little embarrassing uh, to witness, let alone to repeat. They have to create a binary narrative of between good and evil. You know, every everybody we fight, whether it's Saddam Hussein or Vladimir Putin becomes the new Hitler. Uh, the Ukrainians become uh, the, the angels or the defenders of liberty and democracy. This is a cartoon vision, of course, of what's happening that but this happens in every conflict but i think it's especially uh, important for those who uh, are prosecuting the war to maintain that narrative uh, because we're not directly involved in ukraine and at a certain point especially with the economic suffering that is afflicting europe and up to a lesser extent the united states uh, people are going to ask why are we pumping all this money uh, into ukraine uh, we, we've given more money to Ukraine, the United States, than we spend on the State Department, annual budget of the State Department. Uh, and so I think that there's uh, uh, special vigilance in terms of shutting down voices. But, you know, this is taking that conflict out of context. But it's the equivalent of uh, accusing somebody who talks about the Versailles Treaty and the onerous reparations that were imposed on Germany uh, as uh, leading or causing the rise of fascism as being a fascist. It, it, it's, uh, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, we, if we don't understand how these processes work, uh, then we're not going to prevent uh, a, a crisis from happening. It's very easy to think of scenarios that could lead on to nuclear war. So, so far, Russia has not attacked supply lines, the supply lines that are bringing in massive supplies to Ukraine. Uh, actually, Western analysts have wondered why they're not doing it. Well, sooner or later, they might do it. In that case, they run into a conflict with NATO at that point. Your imagination can move very quickly up the escalation ladder. Uh, again, there are two ways to deal with that. One way is violence, what comes naturally to the United States and its allies. The other way is negotiation and diplomacy. Well, what do we see? A hundred percent talked about escalating violence. We oppose the division of the world in competing blocks that invest in rampant militarism, hypermodern weapons of mass destruction, and a new Cold War. We believe that lasting peace can be achieved only by replacing all military blocs with an inclusive international security framework that de-escalates tensions, expands freedoms, fights poverty, limits exploitation, pursues social and environmental justice, and terminates the domination of one country by down another. With these thoughts in mind, we call upon Democrats across the world to join forces in a new non-aligned movement as a route to lasting peace and globally shared prosperity. Done, we need to basically move from a militarized world of international relations to a demilitarized, humanized world of international relations if we're gonna get out of here alive. But we can do that, and if we can get the, um, you know, the uh, the tools of the military-industrial complex, the uh, economic and political elites on all sides of the conflict, get them out of the position of calling the shots here. 
and let's put um, People, Planet, and Peace, you know, back in charge. Back in March, uh, again, this was a negotiation that was mediated by Erdogan. Uh, the Ukrainians and the uh, Russians were on the verge of a peace deal. Uh, what happened? According to the Ukrainian media, Boris Johnson went to Kiev and told Zelensky that, first of all, uh, the West would not support a peace deal with Russia. This peace deal, by the way, did not involve, as far as I could tell, based on reports, you know, Ukraine ceding the Donbass to Russia or Kherson or Zaporozhye or Luhansk. What it did involve was a guarantee of neutrality. That was the focus of the deal. It is a much better deal than Ukraine could probably get now. And yet the British and the Americans tanked it. They, they promised U Ukraine, at the same time they were saying they wouldn't support it, they promised Ukraine massive delivery, deliveries of weaponry. And ultimately, they are the ones who killed the negotiation between Russia and Ukraine. And now the reality is that Ukraine could probably not do a, a deal as favorable as that one. I can't imagine that the Russians, after the, the, the losses they've sustained and the cost they've incurred, would be willing simply to march out of the areas they now control. There have to be some territorial concessions. And this is something that I think is a price that ought to be paid uh, for the simple reason that it is the humane thing to do. Ukrainian lives will be saved. You can begin reconstructing the country. In the long run, perhaps these areas can become reintegrated to some degree, the areas that Russia now controls with uh, the other parts of Ukraine. At least some kind of a free t trade deal, an open border. Uh, these are things that are absolutely essential and to say to the Russians, we won't even sit at the table with you until you overthrow a government that is supported by some 80% of the Russian people or until you withdraw all of your troops from Ukraine is a recipe for no uh, peace deal at all. Uh, we should be sitting out at the table without preconditions imposed on either side. And let's see where these talks lead us. And at the end of the day, if they fail, if they fail and if the Russians prove themselves to be unreasonable and unwilling to negotiate, well, at least we can say we tried. But we haven't even tried, Zane. And given the, the cost and the suffering that uh, Ukraine is incurring, we should at least make a good faith effort.